Hi, this is Elliot Fisherman, and welcome to part two of Abdominal Pain in the ED, focusing on GU pathology. And I left you with this case before. The patient has a small left kidney with diffuse calcification. What could this be? Look at it on the coronal views or on the MIP imaging. It really is a small atrophic kidney with dense calcification. It's not simply stone disease. Yes, there are stones in the upper pole, but what gives you a small atrophic kidney with calcification? Now you could say, well, perhaps old trauma could do it. Here it is with some contrast enhancement. Right kidney looks good. The left kidney, most of what you're seeing, maybe is a little enhancement. Most of what you're seeing is just the calcification. There it is on the coronal view. You could say, well, old trauma, but doesn't quite have the look of trauma, though I guess you never could exclude trauma. It doesn't look like a tumor. It looks like infection. So what infection can involve the kidney? We don't think about it a lot. It can involve the ureter. It can involve the renal pelvis or the kidney. And that's going to be tuberculosis. TB is uncommon, but again, we, TB is making a comeback. We see a lot of lung TB, a lot less in the abdomen, but it's something to think about. Now, other infections, emphyseminous pyelonephritis, these are typically patients who are really sick, often nursing home patients. 90% have poorly controlled or uncontrolled diabetes. Organisms, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, very aggressive. These patients are surgical emergencies, assuming they're surgical candidates at all. CT shows the parenchyal enlargement and destruction, the areas of air within the kidney, ureter, or perirenal, pararenal space, fluid collections, air fluid levels, tissue necrosis. Here's just a great example of emphyseminous polynephritis. Look at the destruction of the patient's left kidney. There still is some function present, but most of the kidney is destroyed with lots of air within the kidney. Here it is a few more views of that same patient. The air goes beyond the kidney into the peri and pararenal space. This is a surgical emergency. People have tried putting nephrostomy tubes in, doing other things only because the patients are often poor candidates. But this patient would get a left nephrectomy. Here's another example. Look at the left kidney. It's totally destroyed. This is not tumor necrosis. This is emphyseminous polynephritis. It's like a path pneumonic diagnosis. And here's the third example, multiple fluid levels. Now, the good news is these days, we don't see it that commonly. Though I will admit, I saw a case maybe a couple months ago. Most of the time, people are getting CTs earlier and people are better taken care of. But again, it's diabetic, diabetes out of control, and patients not being monitored. Again, as I mentioned, often nursing home type patients. Now, we talked about infection. We talked about abscesses. Another thing to talk about is infarction. Now, infarction can be due to a number of different things. You could see thromboembolism, thrombus in the left side of the heart or aorta, aneurysm of the aorta, renal artery, plaque from atherosclerotic disease, septic emboli in a patient with bacterial endocarditis, transcatheter embolization or complications from other procedures, and even dissection of the aorta into the renal arteries. We also can see infarction in vasculitis. Polyarthritis nodosa is a good example. We can see it in trauma with injury to the renal artery or penetrating injury as part of paraneoplastic syndromes, as part of hypocoagulability states, and acute venous occlusion. Now, when you think about renal infarction, it can be segmental or global. When it's segmental, at times it's difficult to distinguish from polynephritis. History may be helpful. Usually the sharp margins are what's particularly helpful. This can be an isolated process or part of multi-system involvement, which means you can have unilateral or bilateral renal infarcts, but also splenic infarcts and liver infarcts, which make the diagnosis a whole lot easier. Symptoms range from acute flank pain to FUO to hematuria. When you look at specifically the findings in renal infarct on CT, focal versus global involvement, usually due to arterial occlusion, sudden onset in nature. And if you look carefully at the renal arteries, you can see the thrombus, maybe unilateral or bilateral, depending on the etiology. Cortical rim sign, which means just enhancement of the rim of the kidney due to collaterals.
basically from the capsular vessels can be seen with global infarction. And if you miss an infarct, chronic renal infarction can present as a small kidney. It can almost look like the case of TB I showed you a little bit ago. Here's a nice example of septic emboli. You can see a defect in the renal artery, decreased attenuation of the right kidney. Half the kidney, you tend to be losing the cortical medullary interface. But here you can see the thrombus right there. So you're not going to confuse it with acute polynephritis. There's the thrombus again. So look very carefully at the renal arteries and make sure that you can follow them in their entirety right there. Here is another patient with renal infarction. Again, cyst left kidney, decreased function right kidney compared to left, large area of decreased attenuation. And then when you look at the volume rendered views, look at the cutoff of the vessels. These are multiple small infarcts causing significant infarction in the patient's right kidney. Very nicely shown here on the MIP imaging and shown here on later phase imaging as well in the kidney. Again, you think about infection, but again, it seems to be a little bit better defined. Once you look at the vessels carefully, it makes it easy. Here's that same patient with some visualization of the vessels using cinematic rendering, as well as the global areas of decreased attenuation, very nicely shown on these images. Now here's a couple of cases putting it all together. Patient at atrial fib and abdominal pain there's thrombus in the patient's left atrial appendage. Then as you scan down, there's infarcts in both kidneys. The infarct is larger in the left kidney than the right, but you can see it very nicely. You can see it on the late phase, excretory phase imaging, bilaterally as well. And there it is nicely shown on the coronal views with the extension on excretory phase imaging, better seen in the left kidney than in the right kidney, okay? very nicely defined. Or in this case, there's a thrombus in the ascending aorta. Thrombi, we're seeing them more commonly, they can send little pieces downward, occlude vessels like the iliac or femoral or popliteal, but you also see it here in the arch, multiple thrombi. When you get to the abdomen, there are infarcts in both the left and the right kidney, very nicely shown. You can see it here on the axial images, in venous phase imaging, they extend far worse on the left kidney than the patient's right kidney. Or here is an example of a global infarct. Now, global infarct is more common in patients who've had, let's say, aortic aneurysm surgery or who've had adrenal surgery where the main renal artery is involved. Um, you can see you have the peripheral enhancement, that's the capsular vessel, but the entire kidney is infarcted, low density. Here's a patient who had adrenal surgery. Look at the left kidney. It's decreased attenuation. There's no enhancement. There it is on the 3D rendering on the later phase. Total infarction of the kidney. The only thing you could do for this patient is do a left nephrectomy. And here it is nicely shown with the cinematic rendering. Now, we also, besides looking at the arteries, look at the renal vein. We spoke about renal vein thrombosis often related to tumors that you have thrombus in the renal vein, and maybe even into the IVC in a patient with a renal cell. But there are other reasons for renal vein thrombosis, often inflammatory. Clinical manifestations vary by the rapidity of the venous occlusion. The most common etiology is nephrotic syndrome, though it can be seen with primary hypercoagulability states, malignant tumors, infection, trauma, and post-renal transplant complication. Here is just some of the lists of the renal vein thrombosis, hypercoagulability states, antiphospholipid syndrome, vasculitis, sickle cell, amyloid, trauma, and renal tumors. So we know with tumors it's easy. You see the tumor, you see the extension, most commonly a clear cell. Occasionally, I showed you some examples of TCCs. But when you don't see a tumor, then you got to be thinking about hypercoagulability states or other processes. This article by Wang making the point that CT is the imaging method of choice for diagnosing renal vein thrombosis, non-invasive, less expensive, with a high sensitivity and high specificity.
Here's a nice example of a patient with glomerulonephritis, stranding in the left kidney, but you can see this thrombus in the left renal vein, very nicely shown on the coronal views. There's no tumor present, but a large, almost occlusive thrombus. Yet, despite that, there's still pretty good function in that patient's left kidney. Patient will be treated with uh, medication for the thrombus and should do fine. Here is a few more images showing the large thrombus in the left renal vein. Here's another patient with left renal vein thrombosis as well. A little delayed enhancement of the left kidney compared to the right. And here's another patient with partial thrombosis of the left renal vein. Patient with end-stage renal disease. There is some flow getting through the renal vein, but the majority is not. And you can see it very nicely here as we do the reconstructions. Now, renal vein thrombosis, this is an interesting case because the patient had renal cell but had a right nephrectomy, was doing well. This renal vein thrombosis was picked up incidentally on the routine follow-up on the patient's yearly visit. So, renal vein thrombosis sometimes can be relatively silent. Now, of course, you're not going to see renal vein thrombosis on a non-contrast scan. And we've made that point about vascular processes being missed. The importance in patients with hematuria, if you don't find the stone, you need to go further. Look at the right kidney. It doesn't look all that impressive, but look at it when we give IV contrast. There's a large AVM by the right hilum. Vascular processes are easily missed on non-contrast CT. Vascular processes may be the reason the patient presents with flank pain and presents to the ER setting. So again, the importance of IV contrast in this scenario. Again, even in retrospect, it's hard to call anything even when you know it's there. And again, just some nice examples of the MIP imaging showing you the size of that AV malformation. And renal AV malformations are rare and they may be acquired or congenital. They can be a sequela of trauma. Hematuria is the major and most common symptom, either clinical manifestations or other clinical manifestations. Hypertension, cardiac failure, abdominal pain can occur, but it's usually hematuria. Here's just a great example of AV shunting. Look at the renal veins on the non-contrast scan. They're huge. What's going on? If I showed you the excretory phase, you can see the large renal veins in fullness in the hilum of both kidneys, and you're still kind of a little bit perplexed what's going on. But when you look at the arterial phase, look at that AV shunting. Look at it on the 3D reconstructions. This is the most impressive example of AV shunting I think I've ever seen, beautifully shown on the 3D mapping. Now, renal AV malformations can be due to prior infections, stone disease, and trauma. Here's a good example. Look at the right kidney, that AV malformation. Again, very nicely shown in the high limb, stranding by the kidney. Again, to make the point that you will logically and not surprisingly miss AV malformations on non-contrast scans routinely. Here it is, the MIP imaging showing you the AV shunting, the AV malformation. And here it is on the cinematic rendering. Again, putting all that together is really a very nice way of reaching the diagnosis. So I think it's very important when we look at the kidneys in the ER setting. Yes, you think of stone disease. Yes, you think of infection. Yes, you think of infarction. Yes, you think of tumor. But think about vascular process, AV malformations, AV shunting, pseudoaneurysms, the entire spectrum of things we should think about. What about this case, hematuria? Non-contrast, not that impressive. Coronals, maybe the spleen's a touch big. Now we're looking, early phase, spleen's pushing on the left kidney. Do you see much else? Not really, but now look at the excretory phase. Look at the patient's calyces. As you look more and more carefully, you see this little thing right here, this outpouching, that kind of golf tee we speak about. Also look at the upper pole of the right kidney calyx. Here we're showing you why when you're looking at hematuria, why when you're looking at renal pathology, the excretory phase images become so common and so important because you are going to miss papillary necrosis. If you don't have excretory phase images,
you're going to miss papillary necrosis. Now, the point I made about waiting only four minutes or five minutes is shown nicely here because there's dense contrast in the calyces, but it's not too dense. It was too dense, you would miss the papillary necrosis because there would be lots of beam hardening. Two important entities associated with a sickle cell disease include segmental infarction and papillary necrosis. So when you think about papillary necrosis, re patients with sickle cell disease common in big city ERs are something to think about. We also think about papillary necrosis in patients who've taken too many pain meds, particularly uh, aspirin. We talk about papillary necrosis on excretory phase imaging as calocele blunting or excreted contrast enveloping necrotic sloth papilla, the so-called golf ball on T sign. Excellent article by Satomi Kawamoto, and I'll show you a few slides from that article. Renal medulla and papilla are vulnerable to ischemic necrosis because of the unique arrangement of their blood supply. Risk factors for papillary necrosis, diabetes, analgesic abuse, high-dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, sickle cell chronic infection like TB, and acute urinary obstruction, renal vein thrombosis, and chronic alcohol abuse. Again, things that you need to think about. In this article, we talk about papillary necrosis, the medullary types or ball on T appearance, or the papillary type with the lobster claw appearance. I think it's worthwhile spending some time putting this lecture on pause right now and reading through or copying this slide and then studying it. Look up the article in radiographics on papillary necrosis by Dr. Kawamoto. Here's just a few more examples of that ball on T configuration, very nicely shown in this case. And here's the slough papilla that lops the claw sign. So again, we need to look at the excretory phase imaging. You can see in all of the cases, the best way of seeing it is the coronal MIP imaging. I tell our residents and fellows, you got to look at MIP imaging when you're looking at the kidneys. It only takes a second, but small tumors in the calyces, small tumors in the ureter, and papillary necrosis will be missed unless you look very carefully at this. Now, the next thing I want to speak about is bladder cancer and how bladder cancer presents in the ER, often as an incidental finding or sometimes as a suspected finding based on the patient's clinical history. But we're kind of running out of time for this talk. Let's take a break and come back in a few minutes. See you then. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.